Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of Epidemics of Injustice. We will start in just a minute, but in the meantime, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat with your name and pronouns. Please check in using either the link or the QR code. And as always during the presentation, please feel free to put questions or comments in the chat. Those will be collected by our TAs throughout, um, but there will also be time for questions at the end. So feel free to keep them in your mind. And at the end, you can raise your hand and ask them as well. So you are muted upon login, so you're not able to unmute yourself or share your screen or anything. And if you are using a phone for audio, please just remember to mute your line. Um, but like I said, feel free to use the chat box um, throughout the presentation. As always, I am Zoe Harris, and I'm joined by Wendy, Marjorie, and Nancy this evening. This course is um, sponsored by the Collaboratory for Health Justice here at UIC, and we encourage you to learn more about them and the great work that they do both here and in the community um, of Chicago. Please always to remember to listen with an open mind for this lecture and for all of our lectures. Just remember to have mutual respect and appreciation for one another respect the information that we talk about in this space. And just always remember that if there is disruptive or disrupt disrespectful language, we will remove you from the class session, which we do not want to do. Um, so just please be cognizant of that. Today's lecture might have some material that's difficult to discuss. So if you need to step away, please take care of yourself during the presentation. It's always important to make sure that you know um, your boundaries and what makes you feel uncomfortable. And again, we always like to do our land acknowledgement. So the University of Chicago stands on the original homelands of the Miami Three Fires people, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, who've been stewards of this land for a generation, as Illinois is also home to a diverse native community of more than 75,000 tribal members. And many of those live in the Chicago area. And if you do not live in Chicago, we highly encourage you to look into the indigenous people of your own lands. And finally, why you are all here today, um, I would like to introduce our speakers, Jamal Spencer and Christine Mitchell. So Jamal Spencer is an activist with the Deeper Than Water Coalition, an abolitionist group led by currently and formerly incarcerated people and their families to end toxic water and medical neglect in Massachusetts. And Christine Mitchell is a senior research associate with the Health Instead of Punishment Program at Human Impact Partners, a national nonprofit based in Oakland, California, committed to bringing the power of public health to social justice campaigns and movements. She's an organizer with the Boston-based Deeper Than Water Coalition and a co-author of the American Public Health Association policy statements on law enforcement, violence, and carceral systems. She has a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School and a Doctor of Science in Social and Behavioral Health Sciences from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So round of applause for Jamal and Christine. Hey, thanks y'all. Um, so I'm gonna start with just a, um, a short-ish, um, 20 minute or so uh, intro to start the research on policing and incarceration and health um, and why abolition as a public health strategy um, should be something that we're talking about and moving towards in public health. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jamal and we'll share some of his experiences with y'all. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Great, does that work? Everyone can see my screen. Cool. Um, I am not gonna keep an eye on the chat. So if something happens that you need my attention, um, just come off mute and let me know, it'd be great. Um, so I want to start out just with a little thought experiment, and I'll have a little, a few of these throughout. Um, let's start off just encouraging you to think of a time when you felt safe. Who was there? What were you doing? What did it feel like? Who was not there? Try to imagine it as vividly as you can. And then think to yourself, 
were the police there at the time when you felt safe? Most of the time, people will say no to that. Um, the idea being that um, policing uh, is not equivalent to safety, even though that is often the dominant narrative. Um, so I want to start too just by um, acknowledging the moment we're in, acknowledging um, that we continue to be in the middle of a pandemic that is wreaking havoc in carceral settings that is spreading rampantly. Um, we are not decarcerating uh, fast enough or as many people as we need to be. Um, police are still killing people every day. Um, and I wanna echo what Zoe said earlier that some of these topics are gonna be challenging to hear and if you need to step away, please do that. Um, I also wanna to acknowledge too that many of you in the room um, might have lived experience with this. Um, and those who have lived experience don't need statistics or a slide deck or a professional organization to tell you that policing and incarceration are harmful to health. Um, I'm gonna just provide some of that data today, um, but keeping in mind that uh, we need to trust the experiences um, of people who have, who have been harmed by policing and incarceration first beyond LS. I'll start with talking about policing. Um, so the historical context of inequities in policing, um, US policing evolved from ruling class efforts to control um, the immigrant working class in the North and then efforts to control black people um, with slave patrols in the South. So policing really um, arose from a, a place of oppression and social control. Um, in the late 1960s and 1970s, um, the war on drugs, tough on crime policies, all arose as a way to maintain that social control, um, especially over black and brown people. And then paired with the increased militarization of police, um, we see them now with tanks and helicopters, um, all sorts of weapons and protections from accountability um, that we see often, they are not held accountable for doing harm. Um, the system of policing functions to perpetuate racism um, and to protect the interests of, uh, of white people, wealthy people, um, the ruling class in the criminal legal system. So just some, some data on the scope of the problem of police killings, police violence. Um, so according to data collected by the Washington Post, which they've been collecting data since 2015, um, around a thousand people are killed by police every year on average. So that's about three people per day. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, is that um, getting data on police and policing is very challenging. It often comes directly from police, um, which means that there is inherent bias built right into it. Um, and often some of our best data on policing and police violence just comes from crowdsourcing, um, comes from, uh, you know, people gathering data from experiences in their local context, from uh, news stories um, and pulling that together. Um, so in 2016, um, black and indigenous people were over two and three times respectively more, time, more likely to be killed by law enforcement than white people. And whenever we talk about this, um, I like to emphasize that that is because of the racism that is inherent in policing. Um, it is not because of any sort of um, inherent criminality um, of uh, black or indigenous people. It is because um, law enforcement policies and practices are founded in racism. And so we see that play out, right? And so this is um, a study that looked at the 50 largest police departments in the US um, of the 4,400 people shot by police in those police departments in a six year span from 2010 to 2016, 55% were black, um, which is more than double the proportion of the black population in these departments jurisdictions. So we can see from that data 
exactly what the history of policing is, right? So policing is doing exactly what it was established to do, um, which is uphold whiteness and white supremacy and wealth. Um, so often when we think of policing, we think of the harms of policing on health, we think of police violence um, and police killings. But there's also the violence of just everyday policing, um, encountering police in your neighborhoods, in your communities. Um, so even in the absence of physical violence, there are several studies that have found um, that stops that people experience as unfair or discriminatory or intrusive um, are associated with uh, mental health impacts. So symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, one study found an association between police killings of black individuals and subsequent poor mental health among black adults living in the same state. So there's a sort of spillover effect um, when someone is living in a state where someone has been killed by police. Um, and then again, we see the way that racism plays a role in that. So in the span of time between 2004 and 2012, 52% of NYPD stops were black residents um, and black people are only 23% of the general population in New York. Um, and again, to emphasize that is because of the racism built into the policies and practices of policing. So one thing that we see a lot of um, when we're talking about changing the system of policing um, are these reforms, right? So um, a popular one is community policing. I'm just gonna walk through all of these and sort of show what the data is behind them. Um, so popular one is community policing. 70% of police departments say they're already using poli uh, community policing. Um, there is data that shows that it increases police legitimacy, but not that it decreases police violence. Um, so we're looking at, a, at, a, um, at an outcome there that is about trust in police, that's about police legitimacy, but isn't actually about um, reducing police violence or um, reducing the impact of policing on health. Um, we also know that community policing can increase um, surveillance of communities by putting more police officers um, into certain communities. So we can cross that one out. Um, we also see tasers, arming police with tasers instead of guns um, as a reform that's suggested. Uh, but there are still more than 500 deaths by tasers um, from 2001 to 2014. Um, and 90% of those deaths is when the person was unarmed. Um, so tasers can also be just as deadly. Um, a lot of places are putting in body cameras into place, um, but we know that that ends up putting more money into police departments to fund getting body cameras for them. Um, there's no standardized policy for what to do with the footage um, to whether that is shared publicly. Um, and in a national study of over 2000 departments, um, there's actually a statistically significant association of police officers wearing body cams with a 3.6% increase in fatal police violence. Um, so that is not actually a great reform either. Increased training for police. We often see de-escalation training or implicit bias training being recommended. Um, there really isn't a lot of research or data um, on whether implicit bias training changes behavior or whether it uh, decreases police violence. But again, we know that increasing training for police also pour more money into policing instead of into communities. And then finally, um, a lot of folks say we need more diversity within police forces. So if we had more women on the force, if we had more black people on the force, um, then we'd see a decrease in police violence. Uh, but there are several studies that sort of debunk that. Um, one study found that there's little effect of having increased diversity on police forces. Um, and in fact, that uh, as the ratio of black officers rose in a department up to a threshold of 25%, um, the number of fatal encounters between police and black residents actually increased. Um, at 40%, that trend flips. You would need at least 40% of the force to be black in order for that. Um, to be at all effective. 
So what should be what should we be recommending instead? Um, a public health approach uh, focuses on primary prevention. So it focuses on looking upstream at how we can prevent people from encountering police in the first place. Um, and so some suggestions of ways we can do that. Uh, decriminalization, so decriminalizing activities that are really shaped by the experience of marginalization. Um, so things like houselessness, substance use, and sex work um, divest from policing. Right, so this is the whole movement from 2020 to defund the police is really a public health movement um, to divest from police and then invest in the social determinants of health. Um, things like housing, education, healthcare, employment, transportation, clean food and water. Um, when folks have the things that they need, um, then they will be less likely to. Um, need to turn to activities that are shaped by that experience of being marginalized. Um, and then finally build up, so invest in non-police community-based and community-led programs for responding to violence and crisis. So for example, we see community-based violence intervention programs, transformative justice programs, um, and then uh, there have been a number of non-police mental health crisis response um, options that are being built up in communities that are really great. I like to point to um, MH First, which is in Oakland and Sacramento, California, um, which is completely non-police. So is not filtered through a police hotline, is not funded by the police, um, doesn't touch the police at all, has their own separate line, um, their own separate funding source, as opposed to a model like Cahoots, which um, Cahoots is actually like a nod to the fact that they're in Cahoots with the police. Um, they are funded by the police and they are, they are sometimes a um, co-response model. So CAHOOTS is definitely a step up from having police respond to mental health crisis, but we can go further still. Um, and now shifting to talk about incarceration a little bit. Um, just to take another minute um, to breathe as we move out of, um, out of that section and into a very related one about incarceration. Um, and then think about why people are incarcerated. Sit with that for a minute. So we see very similar patterns play out in incarceration. Um, that people are incarcerated because of policies and practices that exist in our society. Um, that are racist and that are meant to protect um, ruling class interests. And it starts from a very young age, right? So it starts with school, it starts with school punishment. Um, so for example, in schools, we see zero tolerance policies um, and that's based on broken windows policing theory. Um, it sets sort of this predetermined punishment um, for students for specific rule infractions, regardless of the situational circumstance that might have led um, to a student doing something that is that is termed a rule infraction. Um, Gun Free School Act that was passed in 1994 um, and that mandated a year long out of school suspension for any student caught bringing a weapon to school, again, regardless of any sort of individual circumstance. And then finally, willful de defiance suspensions. Um, so the way they define willful defiance is disrupting school activities or otherwise willfully defying the valid authority of school staff. Um, so this was law in California for a long time uh, and 40% of school suspensions in California uh, in the year between 2010 and 2011 were for this willful defiance. Thankfully that is now being shifted um, as a policy. And so when we see a school punishment play out like that, we also see racial inequities in the same way. Um, so 40% of students expelled from schools each year are black, despite only making up 15% of the general population of young people. And again, keeping in mind the context, right, that those policies and practices that I talked about in the last slide are formed from, um, from a, a groundwork, a foundation of racism. And that is what leads to these racial inequities. Um, for example, we see way more school resource officers or school police officers um, in communities that have large black and brown populations. 
70% of students arrested in school or reported to law enforcement are Black or Latinx. Um, and then Black children are 3.5 times more likely to be suspended from school than white children. Um, and we know that uh, teens who experience a childhood suspension are more than twice as likely to be arrested than those who had the same observable risk for a suspension, but avoided being sanctioned. Um, so you can see how racial inequities in punishment begin at a very young age um, and bring us to incarceration, right? So that's the, that's the idea behind the school to prison pipeline. Um, Pretrial incarceration is another you know, part of incarceration um, where people are incarcerated in jail um, before they have been convicted of anything. Um, so on any given day, that's about 482,000 people. Um, so that's 65% of the total national jail population each day. 90% um, of people who are incarcerated pretrial are there because they can't afford bail or no other reason than they just can't afford um, to bail themselves out of jail. Uh, and we know that jail populations have more than tripled since the 1980s and 99% of that growth is because of pretrial incarceration. So the impacts of incarceration on health, um, that sort of sets the scope of the problem. Now talking about how it impacts health. Um, this photo um, is a photo of a makeshift filter um, that someone in Massachusetts sent us, um, the Deeper Than Water Coalition, which Jamal and I can talk more about, um, that they used to filter out the water in the prison. Um, just held it over the top. This was a white white T-shirt. Um, this is this is how the Deeper Than Water Coalition came to exist. Um, as we learned about the toxic water in Massachusetts, um, and then you know the reason we call ourselves Deeper Than Water is because the, the problems of incarceration go so far beyond water. Um, but even that very sort of basic. Uh, human need and human right is also denied. Um, and that's not just in Massachusetts, that's, that is a national problem. Um, so some of the conditions inside um, beyond the water that also harm health, um, there's poor ventilation. We see major problems with that with COVID. Um, that's part of the reason, one of many, uh, that has led to um, widespread uh, infectious disease, including COVID right now. Um, extreme temperatures, so extreme heat in the summers, extreme cold in the winters, black mold, poor plumbing infrastructure, um, the toxic water, lack of nutritious food, um, uh, infectious disease, and then sort of the, the both mental and physical impacts of the isolation and stigmatization of being incarcerated, of being separated um, from folks' communities and loved ones. Um, and then the neglect, abuse, and physical violence that happens um, behind prison walls. Um, so how do we see this playing out? So when compared to non-incarcerated people, people who are incarcerated have a higher prevalence of a whole bunch of things. Um, so including HIV, other infectious diseases, um, mental health diagnoses, hypertension, health, heart-related problems, diabetes, asthma, stroke, um, and overall lower life expectancy. And so again, that is because of um, the health harms of incarceration itself, the way that health is neglected um, inside. And then also all of the sort of social determinants of health um, that might, might lead a person to being policed, to being criminalized and to being incarcerated. Um, all of those things can also harm health. Um, each year of incarceration in prison takes two years off of an individual's life expectancy. Um, and then to, to ground this in COVID into right now, early estimates um, suggested that the case rates of COVID in US prisons was at least 5.5 times higher than the general US population. And so again, to, to do something similar um, with the policing, some of the common opposing arguments or common reforms that are suggested to incarceration um, one is building nicer or trauma-informed jails. 
Um, so often people point to Norway, jails and prisons in Norway um, as something to strive towards, as something that the US should, should aim to um, make our prisons more like. Um, but the actual data and research on prisons in Norway um, is that folks coming out have high suicide rates, that there's high reported dissatisfaction with healthcare um, from folks who are incarcerated in Norway, um, that a quarter of the people who are incarcerated in Norway are confined to just their cell for more than 16 hours a day, um, which is approaching uh, UN standards for torture. Uh, and so the idea of punishment, punitive practices um, persists uh, even in prisons that are considered you know, trauma-informed. Um, electronic monitoring, the use of electronic monitoring rather than having people incarcerated in prisons is really just an extension um, of carceral settings into people's own homes and communities. Um, so there's a 2011 survey from the National Institute of Justice um, that surveyed folks who were being electronically monitored, found that 22% of people who are on electronic monitoring were fired from their jobs. And we know that job loss is associated um, with all kinds of negative health consequences. Um, and then there's a survey of immigrants who were being electronically monitored um, done in the last few years. 90% uh, of those folks reported that electronic monitoring harmed their physical health and 88% reported that it harmed their mental health. Um, uh, another is that decarceration is not fair to survivors, right? So when someone has survived um, violence or harm, um, how do we get justice and accountability, right? And so the idea that punishment is um, equivalent to or correlated with justice and accountability is something that we need to challenge and problematize. And part of that is by listening to survivors, right? And so um, uh, research that has been done in speaking to survivors and trying to capture their experiences and their desires, um, the, an overwhelming majority of survivors uh, prefer some form of accountability that happens outside of the carceral system. Um, and often that is uh, um, uh, the, the carceral system, the criminal legal system is also harmful to survivors by putting them through um, going through the court system. And of course, um, survivors are not a monolith, right? Um, people desire different things in response to the harm that they faced. Um, but I think the important point here to take away is that we really need to listen to what survivors are asking for. Um, and in surveys, in conversations, in reports, um, survivors are asking for accountability that happens outside of incarceration. And then finally, the argument that incarceration increases public safety. Um, again, with, if we look at COVID, um, we can sort of debunk this. Um, decarceration during the early months of COVID was not correlated to any um, increase in crime rates. Um, again, crime rates are a somewhat problematic uh, way of measuring harm because uh, crime itself is a social construct um, that is created by people in power. Um, and two, it's really just a measure of where policing is happening um, and not necessarily where harm is happening. And so again, if we look at a public health approach here, it looks very similar to the public health approach we recommend um, around policing. So things like decriminalization, reallocating funding um, from incarceration, so from the construction of new jails and detention centers and prisons into the social determinants of health, um, and then developing, implementing, and supporting community-based and non-carceral measures um, to ensure accountability, safety, and well-being. Okay, and I'll just end on this section here, which is imagining a different world. What else could we have? And um, how does public health inform that vision? So another minute, um, just to take a breath and think. Um, think of a time when you've been held accountable for harm you've done by someone that you love. What did that feel like? How did the person approach you? 
How do you wish? How did it feel to be accountable? Um, so I like this graphic. This is um, coming from Danielle Sered. Um, uh, she wrote a book called Until We Reckon, which is about violence, incarceration, and uh, a road to repair as a subtitle. Um, and so she draws this distinction between accountability and punishment. So I think it's important that we realize that accountability is not equivalent to punishment, right? And so the differences are here. So accountability is something you choose to do. You choose to do. Punishment is imposed by others with power over you. Um, accountability recognizes and requires your power, including your power to enact repair. Punishment aims to diminish or contain your power, which it presumes can only be harmful. Accountability is fundamentally, fundamentally active, so it requires you to address the suffering that you caused by seeking to transform yourself and to mend and rebuild for others versus punishment, which is largely passive, um, requires you to address suffering you cause simply by suffering yourself um, with no pathway to provide anything to others. Accountability deepens relationship and connection. Punishment severs it. Accountability fosters healing and restoration, both of yourself, um, of the person who's experienced harm and of your relationship. Punishment fosters shame and isolation. Um, and so accountability here, um, there's evidence base for, for uh, this as a form of accountability. Um, we certainly always need more, <laughs> um, but uh, when we talk about accountability that happens outside of punishment, um, often we're talking about restorative and transformative justice. Um, so non-punitive, non-retributive processes. Um, that address interpersonal harm by bringing together the people who are involved to decide together how to heal and repair that harm. Um, and then transformative justice building upon that by not just focusing on the individuals and the individual relationship and the harm that happens at the individual level, but also on the larger systems and the structures that created the conditions for that harm to occur. Um, investing in communities is an important strategy um, in a world that we want uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's an abolitionist scholar and an educator, says abolition is about presence, not absence. It's about building life-affirming institutions. So, so often um, when people think about abolition, they think it's just like, uh, you know, we get rid of prisons and we get rid of police and there's nothing in its place, right? Um, but really abolition is about building together. It's about presence. It's about um, building things that are life affirming, building things that, um, that are about accountability and not about punishment, um, building things that allow people to thrive. And so I'll just end here, um, again, talking about abolition as a public health strategy. Um, this is a quote from Mariam Kaba's article in New York Times in 2020, um, title is, yes, we mean literally abolish the police. She wrote, we're not abandoning our communities to violence. We don't want to just close police departments. We want to make them obsolete. We should redirect the billions that now go to police departments towards providing health care, housing, education, and good jobs. If we did this, there would be less need for the police in the first place. And so again, that is emphasizing this public health strategy, really investing in the social determinants divesting from the billions that are going towards policing and punishment um, and building up in, uh, our communities. So I'll stop now and pass it over to Jamal. Good evening, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to Christine. As you were speaking, it pretty much sound like my life story that you were speaking of. So I'll bring the experience of everything you said, like the statistics um, and so forth. I am those statistics. And unfortunately, um, starting at a young age, you know, having been expelled from school, um, all Boston public schools, and then kicked out of a program I was placed into where um, because of the violence that was still um, prevalent there, 
guys I knew were still carrying firearms, having knives on them. And so feeling unsafe myself and my mentality was, you know, if they got them, I'm going to have them too. I have to protect myself as best as possible. Um, that mentality will go on pretty much until my, my teen years. Um, and then those were exactly where I made some very bad choices. So um, to segue that, when I speak about the epidemics of injustice, I can tell you that it can be actualized from the underpinnings of poverty, it's sustained by the affluent, and all the systems used to justify the means. I come from poverty. And I also know and understand what it means to be a, per, a product of my choices as opposed to my environment, as some may declare. Unfortunately, like I just said, some of my um, choices were life altering and they resulted in me spending 30 years of my life incarcerated. So my experience with our judicial and penal system is extensive. However, um, I condensed those years and highlight that, um, some of my experience as much as I can in order to best inform you. Um, I'm sure you heard that our penal system is a microcosm to this expanse of our society. Um, that's true. But it's also a place where I learned to acknowledge the differences of race, class, and some of the workings of our government, um, especially as they govern our lives. So to share um, how my life was governed, I would tell you without embellishing that I was ushered through our judicial system without any form of knowledge. Um, of what was happening to me by people who generally referred to me as a docking number. Um, I was sentenced to life um, and the mistreatment by the mindset and hands of people who used to operate without impunity um, from housing to, as um, Christine was saying, the lack of food, its proper nutrients, the medical incompetence, and never mind the generic medication, which only compounds um, health issues, to the job assignments and the enrollment of, of trades and programs there's a major, major difference, um, unfortunately, sadly to say, between what is given to um, black and brown um, and our white counterparts. And oftentimes, um, when you keep you know, doing things and asking, oh, can you get a job? Here goes what they'll say to you. What information do you have for me? And you're like, what? What information do we have for you? I need a job, that's information. Because inside, you know, like you see out here, prices, um, privateering is going on there. So prices increase, but your ability to earn doesn't increase with that. And so oftentimes, you know, when you can't get a job, people start doing or moving by illicit means. Um, whether it's home brew that's made or illegal drugs, or as you know, the pandemic has been going on. So ask me how some of those drugs even entered the institution when there was no physical visitation going on at the time. So with that, a lot of things were happening. And so I want to get to the part where we were talking about a lot of data, a lot of um, statistics. It can be padded. Um, I must say this, because within the confines, like you have a small group of people who will, be, who will do things, but they'll keep putting these numbers up like it's uh, an array of folks doing it. When it's only probably like, let's give it. Norfolk had a population of over a thousand let's say 200 men were committing um, infractions. 200 men committed five or six infractions at a time. They'll double those numbers as if it was more than 200 men when it wasn't. And that's, that's giving it lightly. Um, so when it comes to the programming that they had, as far as the combat that, the programming, which I know is the CRA, um, the Correctional Recovery Academy, that's where most of the infractions was taking place. So something put in place to combat addiction, something put in place to combat so-called um, reduction of violence. That's where most of it was taking place within these programs, but they really wouldn't do too much because they didn't want that shut down. So when you can operate with impunity because there's no accountability as I'm, being, I'm hearing being spoken today, there's no cameras and who can control the narrative, but those who are um, the powers that be. So when you can do these things and answer really to no one, the public is left with the bill. And I often tell people to follow the money if you can, but how is that possible when what they'll say is, what we call protests on the streets, they'll call a riot in prison. And when you can put those words on things such as riot, anything that I'm subjected to, they'll say that I'm one of the worst of the worst or we're dealing with the worst of the worst. And that allows you to turn the other way. Or you're saying, okay, they're locked up for this or they're locked up for that. So 
they deserve what's coming to them. I get that, um, especially I'll say for the uninitiated. I've had the, um, the privilege, oftentimes, like I said, I spent 30 years incarceration. I finally was released in September 30th, right? Um, after going to my parole board and speaking to the parole board about, and how about, they really was asking me about the civil unrest that was going on in the streets, opposed to the things that was taking place with my crime. Um, and I told them I, I didn't grow up trusting the police. Um, I used to see the police and maybe I didn't even do anything, but if my friends started running, I started running because like I said, the mistrust. But I finally told them um, why I carry firearms, um, why I never would call the police, well, um, that's just not things I did. Aside the fact that, you know, when they came around, it wasn't to really assess what happened. It was to get with everybody out there, first and foremost, even if it came to head cracking. And so when I look at that, that's the same thing that was taking place inside the, the um, prison walls in that setting. So it didn't matter who was in to what situation. When they came, they came, gassing, spraying, get everybody under control, and then we'll assess this later. Through a, um, a series of so-called interviews, but those interviews oftentimes led to would well, it be some favoritism going on? We'll do for you if you tell us what's really going on. Not because it was a matter of correction; it was a matter of who can we. I'm going to say corrupt. Who can we get to? Who's going to be an informant? And that happens in prison. Um, and I can tell you this, and don't just take my word. I'm going to ask you to research this. For those who are about to come home, um, there's a unit set up where they'll come to you and ask if you want to work for the police. We will set you up in housing. We will, um, whatever you need. I mean, never mind a job, just come work for us, but we need you to be an informant. If you have the funding to do things of that nature, like I'm out here now, um, having a hard time getting a job, having a hard time with housing because all the stigma I have to deal with. If my family wasn't um, able to employ me, parole would tell me I can't work certain jobs. And um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump because Christine mentioned the device system. I have one on my leg now, and I don't know when they're gonna take it off. So that stops me from moving about in a certain fashion. That stops me from having certain jobs because um, hourly I have to be in um, by 10 o'clock p.m. And if there's a job where I can have an overnight job, I can't have that because of what's on my leg. So. With that, I'm limited. Um, and so I'm in an area where I really don't wanna be at because of things of that nature. Um, I would rather not be in Boston, but see I'm placed back in the very same element or the environment where I was making choices, bad choices, but this time because I'm much older. Um, I'm not saying there's not no anxieties in me being in these neighborhoods, but my man Charlie is, you know, if I have to be somewhere, be around someone, where I feel as though I need a safety piece or what, I, what we used to say in, in prison, an equalizer, and I don't really need to be there. So I try to stay as close as possible to my support network. I make sure I try to call somebody if I'm feeling, um, you know, out of place um, or if there's something I don't really want to be around, I'll call someone. But these are because of, you know, the things I had to go through um, from being away for so long and the mindset in which I had to adopt thinking it was survival of the fittest. So, when I'm talking about housing, uh, I'm gonna go back to that for a minute. Housing and institutions, you, you usually go um, where they assign you, even if it's an environment where, as you know, um, you're not supposed to be in it. For years, years, I was placed inside of um, what they call Plymouth blocks. Plymouth block was 24 hours, 23 hour lockup. Certain days we can come out for an hour. You can choose you know, to exercise. You can choose to take a shower. You can choose when to get on the phone, but you better do that within that hour. Um, because if you miss one or the other and you're caught locked outside that cell, um, that's called a refusal of a housing assignment. And oftentimes you're put in, inside nine block. And so while inside these places and then being given the treatment that we was given because we was deemed STG, which is a security threat group, um, you're often looked at first and foremost with apprehension by especially if it was a new officer coming in. They already painted the picture that you're amongst you know, the worst of the worst. And that wasn't even an environment. I did nothing to even be placed inside that environment. They just so happened to shut the, the prison down when um, men got into an altercation during a search, a guy's TV was placed on the floor. 
he comes in and asks the police why he was still handcuffed and why he still had his leg shackles on. Like, yo, what y'all, can y'all pick that up? They snatched him by his shackles, his ankle shackles, which bust and broke his jaw. And then from that, a group of guys got together, caught the CO who did that, um, and they and they beat him up pretty bad. That was forever shut down Walpole when I was in Walpole. Shut Walpole down for like one of the longest lockdowns in Massachusetts history. Um, from that, that's when, um, from that was born the Plymouth units, the gang box, SCG units. Um, I spent several years there, as well as several years inside what they call nine block, which is 24 hour lockup for the most. You'll probably get 30 minutes of rent, if that. So when those days come in and someone's controlling your food, bringing in, and here's where this comes in play. Some of our food was coming in with um, mice dropping like the milk, or the bread you get, you can clearly see it was, you know, it was chewed on. And when you complain about that, they'll take that time or maybe not at all. It depends on the office that was on most of the time. If there's offices that you don't know and they don't really know you, you're just on deaf ears. And then from that, I mean, one day I can tell you, we held it back out of trays until we could see an authority figure, which was a captain. Um, me at that point in time, I'm fresh in the system. I'm probably like 170 pounds soaking wet. So the other guys was bigger than me on there. I was the first one who, who sell, they would enter. I mean, I would do the same. I mean, this is the one who's gonna be the least resistance. Um, and plus they come in with the body arm, they come in. So as we was trying to let them know about this some problem, they thought that, you know, we were being problematic. They didn't care about what you ate. In their mind, you deserve what was coming to you. But I'm saying, why should I have to eat food that had mice droppings on it? Especially something I have to put my mouth on. Um, like the milk cottons, because you're not giving cups like that. You're not really giving anything that can be deemed any type of weapon or something you can put in your mouth as, you know, like a, a like a, you know, you have like the guard, will guard your mouth, like in boxing. They look at if you're taking like a container and lacing your mouth up, you can stop blows and things of that nature. So I was essentially jumped on by the police. Um, from that, my leg, my right leg, um, the ligaments in it are still messed up to this day. But the staff, the medical staff, would say no, 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 until finally I complained again down the line and told the medical staff member, um, I, listen, I can't really walk too well. Um, oh, she says, okay, well, you need this in emergency. They would quickly, you know, get back with me and say, you know, she wasn't supposed to do that, you know, because um, everything costs money. So if they got to send me out, they have to pay for trips and they have to pay for everything else that goes on the line. So if they can stop that from happening, they will do that. I guess, remember I said, follow the money. Then the issues of medication, you, you get generic medication. I mean, you're gonna, and guys are still going through that. And so um, me being able to, if I was able to show you um, my skin, which I'm still have to go see my primary care doctor for, the water discolors your skin. And so the lack of, you know, I'm gonna say the lotions, other medications that they try giving you, makes your skin, if you can imagine a leopard, um, if I took my shirt and stuff off, that's what you'll see until they're going to administer me some medication when I go in about a week or so, so that it removes, you know, um, the stuff that came from the hard water and then the soap and then, uh, yeah, and then the stuff that was inside the water. I can put it like this here, coffee. If anyone drinks brown coffee, not really black, but brown coffee with no creamer, that's what the water used to look like sometimes, but yet they'll tell you it's drinkable. And then we'll be like, okay, then let's have a cup. And you're like, I'm not drinking that because they get water that's brought into them. They never drink from what we have to drink from. So when I look at all these things, you know, that I lived, not statistically, that's what I was being said here, that I lived, I often wonder um, what type of toxicities would I bring out um, to my family? What type of toxicities would I bring out back in the community? And then how solution based wise do I um do I fight that? Um, how do I, you know, and who do I speak to, you know, to help me combat that? Whereas before, I mean, I used to come through like a bow charging, like, like at a train, which you know was stupid. You know what a train would do to a bow. I mean, we would be eating hot dogs and steaks for days, if, if you will. So with that, I learned to, you know, utilize the pen, the paper, write certain people, um, start getting them inside the institution. Um, at the same time, we met with Deeper Than Water, combined the efforts of, of the things we were doing with, with Deeper, um, as well as um, friends or I say constituents 
um, who are, you know, in so-called public safety, which I would love to see that removed from public safety to health and human services. Um, and that's something I've, I'm still working and fighting to, to this day. But when you're talking about like the enrollment of programs and trades, um, viable skill sets that will help you come out here, you know, and fit into, you know, jobs of that nature. Um, they'll tell you that you often can't really do that, especially if you're doing too much time. If someone's coming in shorter than you, there's a waiting list. And oftentimes you never even get to see um, those schools or those trades. Um, I was fortunate enough that I knew carpentry since a child. Um, but still, it's problematic out here now because certain, you know, places don't take you if you're at a certain age. Even though I'm telling my lips certain weight doesn't matter to me. Um, but like I said, there's a major difference. A major difference. Whereas your job assignments, um, and that's something. And I don't really like to speak about. Cause I heard everybody keep speaking about it on today. But if you're feeling uncomfortable, I'd like to step away. I want to say that if there is something. And I don't want to say it's uncomfortability. If there is something that's tugging at your heart, if there is something that you're feeling in the pit of your stomach, um, I would ask that you get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I would ask that you realize that that's just you, your inner um, voice telling you that you're in the right place. You're hearing the right information. And information is empowering when you plug into something that allows you, you know, as we heard about being accountable, being responsible, and doing responsible is having the ability to respond. That's just short, you know, the way I put it. And so when you can do that and you can handle things of that nature, um, speak up, you know, stand on your demonstration. I'm not saying, you know, um, you know lose um, your, your livelihood or lose your lot in life, but in your positioning and the lives that you're about to um, embark on, your say is more powerful than mine could ever be. Um, unfortunately, I, I see it like that, even though I'm gonna still keep striving, I'm gonna still keep, you know, um, doing what I do because i tell you at my last parole hearing, I've, I've never had opposition. And I'll tell you what opposition means anyone opposing me from the family or anything of that nature. This time I thought I had opposition. However, and I don't like to say the victim, the impacted party was speaking to me directly and parole board, the parole board kept telling um, this woman that she could not speak to me directly. Although you would call her to have to oppose me from coming home. She says, no, I need Jamal to hear me because Jamal um, is someone who I know was very influential out in the city of Boston. He was out um, in the wrong way. These young kids was looking up to him, doing the wrong thing. And, I, and that was very true. Um, I was someone who can tell people to do things that was that was stupid and contrary to their life. So today I use that influence um, for the greater good, um, for them to better themselves. And by her saying what she said to me, um, that was the most impactful parole hearing I ever had, um, even though they shut her down. But when she did get to speak to me, um, it's, it's making me go, um, it's a term go even harder. Um, it's what, you know, what had me come speak with you today um, to let you know that, you know, as someone who could have said, lock him up, throw away the key, or oh, he took this from me, he took that from me. She says, no, um, he's someone we do need out here. Um, he's someone who can make a difference, not feel he makes a difference. And that's why for me, being accountable, being responsible, and standing on my demonstration means the world to me. Um, I don't know how much time I got left um, as far as you know to live. I can tell you, I can count how many years I got behind me. 30 years in prison and I'm 50. I mean, that tells you, I mean, um, what I've been doing with my life. Um, it wasn't always about me me being intellectual or, or using do as my common sense in prison um, because I went in young. So I felt as I had to be a certain way there. Um, and then even when people kept, you know, adding more trauma, especially the ones who I deemed was supposed to be my custodian, um, I could have came out here hateful. I could have came out here saying, I mean, never mind all this, you know, is positivity. I could have came out with a chip on my shoulder, even disguised, you know, um, as a sheep in wolf's clothing, right? I would say I was a wolf in sheep's clothing, excuse me. But my thing was, how do I really make a difference in the lives? And it doesn't really matter if I, if, if I really get myself together. Um, if anyone can remember Hogan's Heroes, 
they fought a war from behind enemy lines just to make sure that, you know, um, they, they, they was committed to the greater good of winning um, the war. So that's how I look at how I'm, I'm to be, you know, fighting behind enemy lines. And so when deep in the water came to me, I, and Jamal, are you worried about getting in trouble? I said, in trouble, I'm already in trouble. We're not doing this. What are we gonna do? Let's do it. And so it's still, it's still a force that I'm, 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 I'm gauged to move with. I don't calculate too much except how to stay out here, how to be better, how to make um, those around me um, better, um, which is why, I mean, speaking to you, you have such, you know, um, abilities to change the world. I hope you would do that. Um, and I know when, I when we talk about, when we talk about punishment, um, yeah, when we talk about punishment, I think it's just like the sim it's similar to like when growing up being exposed, you know, um, I love my mother and dad, but when I when being exposed to how I was disciplined. And again, if I showed you my leg and how it was split open, um, they used to have these belts that had like these little, like these almost like, you know, like, you know, like the punk rockers had the spikes and stuff. My mother tore me up with one of those where I had to go to the hospital. And so, but, I looked at that like I, I can't really remember because I was too young, but I still, I see the scar of it. Um, and I still remember, I don't know what happened to her. I don't know what happened to anything else other than that. But coming in prison, going through the things I do, and I know these people ain't to love me at all. And so the trauma of what I went through in prison far outweighed what I went through in my household, far outweighed the addictions that I witnessed in my, heart, my household. It far outweighed, even I gave you a, when I saw, I lived at 140 Geneva Avenue in Dorchester. Gunmen coming to my house because my father was drug dealer. Shot my uncle with a shotgun, right? And threatened to come in our room, in me and my brother's and sister's room, and do harness unless he gave up his entire stash, which he did. It far outweighed that, and I remember all that like it was yesterday. And so to see the people who were saying they were correcting me, you know, I'm about to come through a rehabilitative process. I can tell you it doesn't take 15, 20 years or life when you're saying you have a program that works to rehabilitate somebody. If you're invested with money and all these nations, yet you have men who are still serving life and dying, um, especially under systems that are not there to help but to harm further. And so, and then still these very, some of these very same men, I'll have to say some, some of these very same men wish they can be out here making a difference in the change out in the world. Wish they can be with their families, their loved ones, their wives, their mothers, their girlfriends, their children. Wish they can come out here and sit and have the conversation that I'm having with you. Um, who and I got to say are much more um, you know, um, intelligent than me, much more um, entrenched, if you will, in the data and research than I am. I can only tell you that I am that data and research. But will I change the polarity? Yes, I will. Um, that's every day. And whether what that success looks like, I mean, I may not go off to be um, a CEO or, or any of a business, anything like that, but um, my household, I will, um, so to speak, um, move it with love. I will move it with humility. I will move it man, with, you know, the very character I know it takes, you know, as far as when it comes to um, having the mindset, you know, um, that's driven, man, by what manhood is supposed to be. I'm opposed to what I thought it was growing up. So when I look at all these things and what prison could have done to me, you know, to deter me from coming out here, being a better person, being a better man, being a better brother. Um, I'm not a father, but uh, um, but that's another story. But being all the above, um, I know that, you know, it takes me almost like an astronaut coming back, a decompression. So every day is about me decompressing, getting rid of those toxicities. Um, and am I there yet? I'm striving. I'm getting better. Um, I'm enjoying, especially being on the side of the wall. But oftentimes, I speak with my fellow um, prisoners. They call me every day. Um, I try to do with them what I can. Um, I try to reach out to the people how they need me. Try to help them and get into like programs and like things like I had to do to come out here. And so, but I know that what I hear from them is a lot of distress, and it often makes me wonder how I used to sound in there when I called out. So I know I won't put my family through that ever again. Send me some pictures, do this and do that for me. What's going on out there? Um, what's happening to who, who's doing what? 
And the crazy part was I would come out here, out in society and catch COVID when I used to lock myself in a, in a cell, put up a, a board, tell people don't come to my cell because I don't want to talk to you. Um, so what we know is isolation out here and being alone. I just thought that, that was just prison to me. That was just me being separated from you. Um, the anxiety of that was just something I've been to before COVID, um, being locked up, being away from my loved ones. So today for me to hear um, how that's going about the mental health aspects um, and black and brown, we really in prison, especially in prison, men were shunning that. I mean, oh, you're going to mental health? Man, son, he's crazy. Oh, he's losing. Oh, he's weak. It's not a weakness because a young friend of mine who, um, as I came out here, would lose himself so much. He went to a dark place so much that they had to medicate the hell out of him. Excuse my terminology. But to understand when he came in as a juvenile, his brother was killed, his co-defendant, and these two kids wasn't even the perpetrators of their crime. I can say that, that's, that's factual. Another friend of mine was, but they took them. So he lost one of his cousins to cancer in prison, who died in prison. His brother was killed out here. His mother died. He had no one else. I can tell you for most of if it wasn't for um, Hank Philippine Ryan being a friend, who now looked at him as a surrogate son, he would have really had nobody on the outside camp for him. So it was things like that when I knew that, you know, mental health was real. I'm someone who would never tell someone, man, uh, man, tighten up, strap up your boots, roll up your sleeves. No, go get some help. Because I can't, I can't professionally be that. Um, I'm not the person you can talk to. So I know it's real, but the trials are real. And even today, I'm supposed to see, um, I'm supposed to find a mental health counselor. And so that's what I'm, I'm seeking. I have to do that. that. That's also a parole condition. I did now telling guys to do that. So I'm, I'm on that as well as trying to better. Um, and a lot of men are going to have to do that because they do not set you up in prison to come out here and succeed as far as reentry and transitional assistance as they should. That also has a difference as to who you're speaking to. Um, so for me, coming out here, did they help me? I don't even have a social security card. I got I to gotta deal with that. Um, I got to deal with trying to open up a bank account. I got to deal with, you know, moving into a place. So I'm going to see if I can do that Sunday. Some people are supposed to help me on as far as getting situated with that. But these are all the things that you were supposed to do before coming out here. Because when you first got incarcerated, excuse me, pre-trial, they asked you so many questions um, about your earnings, where you live, how far you go to school. You already knew all this information um, upon assessment that um, your job history, you knew all this. So coming back out the door, they also assess all that. And so why would you just let me out? Knowing I don't really have, oh, you know, you let me to a halfway house. And then from that, you're longer than I can because you're not our problem no more. You're, you're, you're parole's problem, so to speak. But parole tells me that they can't really help me with too much because you're so-called free. But yet I got this ankle monitor on, I'm on, I'm on curfew. I said, yeah, that's, 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 that sounds about as, a contradiction as I know of but I'm going to play within the rules. I have to play within the rules or I go back to prison. And that's not something I want to do. So when I look at all the things that are indifferent, when I look at all the things who, like programs that I wasn't able, because pre-release was shut down when I got to Palmville. Palmville was a pre-release slash minimum. It was shut down. So you really couldn't do too much but roam around the institution, there was no program that's gonna help you learn about financial stability, financial literacy, computer literacy. Even me getting on this phone was intimidating when I first got the phone and, and it's still problematic because I don't really know how to navigate on Zoom. I don't really know how to navigate towards certain things, even though they say you can go Google certain things. But these, until someone learns that, these are real life, real life situations are not taught so you can come out here and meet the challenges that you're going to face out there. Not someone who was formerly incarcerated, not a returning citizen. And so is that in place? No, it isn't. Um, can it be put in place? Yes, it can. Any of you who are about to embark inside the life, um, or I say the profession of you know law enforcement, 
whether GA, whether clinically or any other level, um, if you say that you're a person who believes in humanity, if you're a person who believes in change, if you're a person who believes in moving someone from an evil mind frame into a love mind frame or where they're supposed to be at, these would be the things that you'll be working on um, to institute. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Rachel Rollins, um, spoke with her, and from that, she created the integrity unit. Um, she used to work with us until she moved into a, a higher level. Um, and she used to come visit us every other Thursday as to what she can do to help better that position. She met a lot of opposition. I knew she would. Um, we all knew she would realistically. But for her to even take the time to come consider what we had to say, spoke volumes to me. Um, U.S. senators do the same thing. They used to do the same thing. U.S., not state senators. Not well, state I right. hate to cut you off, but we mm -hmm. are running short on time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to ask um, at least one question. So um, again, I don't want to cut you off, but if you could wrap up, then we would really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. We were wrapping on the fact that, you know, there are major differences, but we can also make a difference by standing on demonstration. And with that, I will close on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Christine and Jamal. Um, we'll just pose one question and then we'll let everybody go. But we really do appreciate you sharing both the statistics, but also your personal experience. It's so valuable. And I know that we all learned so much from it, myself included. So the question that I'll pose before we close out is kind of a big one, but I think it's an important one. And I'll also put it in the chat. But it's um, from one of our students. If we are to rehumanize incarcerated individuals or those who commit crime and therefore reinstate them of the human rights that they are deprived of, what institutions would be the most important in this transition? Do we think that healthcare for those in the prison complex would need the most attention, specifically mental health? And Jamal or um, Christine, either if you can respond to that. Ladies first, Christine. I want to hear from you first. You go so first. I will say yes. Um, I will say that in order for you to really deal, deal with someone, you have to deal with their mental capacity. You have to start what's in their head. You have to go back and so you know what got them into the space to do the things they was doing. Um, I mentioned earlier poverty was something. So in poverty, as a child, as someone on the um, who up seen the things I grew up seeing and doing. I saw nothing morally wrong with going inside of a store that was had an abundance, even if it was still in the Snicker bar and whatever else, and still not be on my way to school, right? I couldn't function if my stomach was growling. And so my thought process wasn't even on what I was doing. It was on making sure I was fed. When you, when you, when you double that with someone who has their past the capacity to do even greater harm than stealing, I don't went from throwing rocks and apples, excuse me all, to throwing bullets at people. Just so I can say, okay, this is my area. I'm getting money in this area. I need to eat. And if you're getting in my way of eating, then we have an issue. When you have people who are thinking a certain way, then there's a problem. So you have to change that thought process. And I'll just quickly say, I, I, I'm not sure I can choose like the most important. I think it, it requires um, like inter you know, uh, connectedness and building across movements, right? So it's not just uh, prison and police abolition. It's also like, in order to do that, we need housing, we need healthcare, we need employment, we need education, we need all of those systems working together. Um, if you are a student and you are here and a stick around for the Action Lab, you'll hear a little bit more about healthcare inside. Um, but, uh, yeah, that would be what I would say. And then I guess the other thing I would say is um, agreeing with Jared, listen to your hustle um, and um, write to people inside. Just get to know people inside um, and connect. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you're comfortable with sharing your contact information, please just let us know so that we can have people reach out to you for more questions because um, I'm sure that people have plenty. Um, but again, thank you all for coming to Epidemics of Injustice this evening. And students of the course, please remember to jump immediately to the next Zoom session because we have a action lab. So thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.
Thanks. Bye.